the answer to your question. Where, where do I find uh, spirituality in my travels? And um, uh, you know, I, I find it in man-made places. Um, I find it, I find it in cathedrals. Uh, I find it in a humble little cathedral, uh, in a, in a little village where I, I sit in the pew and I can actually feel the wooden carved edge of the pew that's 500 years old and I can feel the grooves made by the leashes of the shepherds that tied their dog to that pew every Sunday 300 years ago because that's a little region where every, every, every uh, uh, parishioner would have had sheep because it was in the Cotswold villages of England. You feel the continuity. You look at the the list of pastors in that church, and it goes back 400 years, unbroken. Uh, you, you look at uh, the light streaming through those windows. Uh, you look at the um, solitary senior citizen sitting alone and praying in the front pew on a, on a Thursday morning. Uh, you just feel that richness. Uh, uh, that's a humble church. And then I just love going into the grandiose churches. And... Uh, I think uh, uh, Protestants are, are generally uh, a little bit, you know, um, skeptical about all that gold leaf and, and all those uh, pudgy winged babies and so on. Uh, but I've learned that if I can park my Protestant sword at the door when I go to St. Peter's Basilica and go in there, <laughs> not as an angry Lutheran, but as a temporary Roman Catholic, it's a glorious experience. And um, for me, St. Peter's Basilica, the most beautiful and breathtaking church on earth is uh, is a is a mark of people's love of God and all that they all, all that they want to do to glorify God and uh, sometimes you know you might say well there's better ways to glorify God than to lavish all sorts of uh, mosaics on the wall but I'm not going to be critical about that I'm just going to say this is gorgeous and I can get it uh, you know so there's lots of ways that you can see how people have praised God, and I'm inspired by that. Uh, music, music, you know, Martin Luther uh, liked to say, I think, uh, he didn't originate this, but he liked to say, when you sing, you pray double. And uh, music, uh, in, in my own faith walk, has been really helpful. And I love the thought that for centuries, music has helped people get closer to God. And of course, when you feel the power of nature, you feel close to God. So for me, walking on top of an alp, for me, stepping into a humble little church. For me, lighting a can candle uh, in, a, in, a, in a Greek Orthodox church uh, surrounded by incense. I went. I was uh, filming a show about Easter, and uh, uh, we just, we just. In fact, it's, it's going to be airing on public television all over the country for Easter every year. And um, thank goodness that year, uh, the Greek Easter was one week after the Western uh, Christian Easter and the Greek Orthodox Easter, so we could film Easter in, in Rome, and we had another crew in, in uh, Spain, and then the next week we were in Greece for, for that Easter Sunday, but the uh, priest there asked me, do you appreciate incense? And he wanted me to understand the importance of incense in a Greek Orthodox uh, style. <laughs> and I said, no, tell me about it. And he said, it's a very important part of the recipe for the Mass, and they'll have a different incense at different places in the Mass, and this incense floats like a ethereal sea around the altar, and it, it, it contributes to the atmosphere. And I thought, wow, I've been for decades worshiping in churches, and it never occurred to me that incense could accentuate the mood and the thoughtfulness and, and, and the emotion of it. And I just love traveling and, and, and being reminded we can never run out of ways to um, broaden our understanding of our faith, and we can never run out of ways to get closer to God. Wonderful words from um, someone who has traveled so extensively. Can I ask, how many of you have been in a church where incense is used? It's quite something, isn't it? I, I, um, I know I experienced that when I was in Jerusalem. And um, I tried that one time when I was at my last pastoral charge with sweetgrass which I felt was a Canadian equivalent of incense and that beautiful aroma of incense. So we're talking together, obviously, from our scripture today of eating together on the road and also what makes for a sacred place. So he talked there, Rick Steves, about all the different sacred places. And clearly, 
where this Feast of the 5,000 was would be one of those sacred places. Can I note parenthetically that those are 5,000 men? So they would not have traveled by themselves, would they, Joan? They would have their wives and children with them, but in St. John's Gospel, the women and children didn't get counted. So it's even a bigger miracle than the 5,000, which are numbered. It's about coming home, isn't it, and reflecting on what was sacred, what wasn't. We talk about the Holy Land as if there's just one place that's holy. But in Canada, of course, we have a growing and deep awareness of the many sacred places. Some of you may have traveled somewhere or been somewhere at home, um, around your home, in Canada or overseas where you're there and you have a feeling you've been there before. A deep spiritual connection with a piece of land, what they call the geography of the heart. This is such an important day for us in Canada, for the geography of the heart and sacred places. For although I don't have a TV here, I imagine that the Pope has now landed in Edmonton. This is an extraordinarily important journey that as he comes to our sacred places, and um, it's hard to overestimate um, how important this trip is. How many people have hoped and prayed for this to go well? Because we all know, we all know, that Christianity has a long and troubling history of conquest. We're talking about questing, but that's not the same as conquest. But there was a time when conquest was our preferred verb. And it played out differently around the world, but we know so well, and we're learning more about what conquest was like here. And that's what brings the Pope to our sacred lands today. So the quest, not conquest, but the quest is about seeking and hearing what other people call sacred. It's surprising, isn't it, that tuna fish sandwiches aren't a sacrament after that beautiful story today. It would be understandable, wouldn't it, if every so often we came to church and you got a fish sandwich or maybe a taco, fish taco or a fish pita, and we'd read that scripture and you'd go, well, this must have been very close to what that felt like at that original time. Our context would be changed by that. We have a different story, the one of the Last Supper in the upper room. But today's visit needs to be honored by the Pope, frail and elderly, it recognizes the history of, and the impact of white supremacy through the years. And we know from the news that this is not old history. This is not yesterday. This is still going on today. So when we hear that, when we experience, when we go overseas or we go to our sacred lands that have less, and we come home, we reflect on what we've seen. We come back and probably we've been changed if we've allowed our hearts to be open as we've eaten the food, the bannock, the smoked salmon, or wherever you are, the shortbread or the afternoon tea, whatever it is, and we come back and we taste that food again in our context, we are reminded of being on somebody else's sacred land and the opportunity for that to influence us and, as Rick Steve said, ways that we have of knowing God. So returning home then, maybe today we have recipes. We might today have a camera full of, uh, on our phone. We are all a little bit like the Pope, aren't we? We're never sure exactly of what we're going to see when we travel. And it can be right here at home where we go somewhere because of something that's happened that we want to set right. And it doesn't have to be an international incident or of an international importance. But we know we have a declaration each week because our denomination and our country have recognized our involvement in that uh, story of called the residential school system and the multi-generational impact of that. So we, as a community, have traveled many ways. We travel when we do the blanket exercise right here at home. And we travel when we go somewhere far away. 
Many of you have been sharing with me this summer your own experiences of travel, what you've seen when you've run into people who didn't want to taste anything new, who wanted to have chicken and chips wherever they were. And also the eye-opening experience of being served or offered things that you don't recognize and you're not exactly sure what to do next. And the heat waves and the forest fires have allowed us to see a great continuity of the impact of our lifestyle right around the world. It's not just Lytton, although it is Lytton again. It's so many other places as well. And because we have traveled, even just traveled by watching the, the news or maybe watching BBC series, Our Planet, Our Earth, with their wonderful photography, we've traveled and we can imagine what has changed because of the heat waves around the world. I was thinking about those 5,000 men and numbered women and children. We know they shared the story because John tells the story and he wasn't there. We know they tell the story because it shows up in the Gospels. I wonder how they told it. I wonder how we would tell the story of following somebody and getting hungry and getting worried about where would we get our next meal. And I wonder if we would just sit down. Jesus said, sit down, there's grass, we'll look after you. I wonder, I wonder how many people turned around and walked away at that point. It's not written down, but I wonder about that. Is it possible that every single person gathered there that day said, yes, I'll stay? That would be earth shattering, wouldn't it? I wonder when they went home, how it impacted them. We know that that was a fishing area, the Sea of Tiberias. So maybe every time they had fish for a while, they remembered. Did I ever tell you about the time that kid shared his fish? When we were going, yes, Dad, we remember that. You told us. But I wonder if they would let it change. I wonder if we would let it change us if something that extraordinary happened. We get quite used to big change. I want you to go back in your mind to, oh, let's just say 1970, okay? I want you to imagine somebody you know, if you have a cousin or brother and sister who says, I'm gonna go traveling, okay, 1970. And you're at the airport with them and you say to them, have you got your phone? Have you got a thousand photographs with you in case anybody wants to see a picture of your cat? I'm just saying by that, we get so used to the technological changes of our day. And yet, just 50 years ago, you know, when, when, you, when you phone somebody out, you say, where are you? Can you imagine what your grandmother would have said if they said, well, where are you? I've just picked up the phone. I'm where the phone was when you phoned me, right? It wouldn't have been a difficult question to answer. We take, for, we have absorbed so much change in our lifetime. That's assuming that most of you were alive in 1970, which I know isn't always true. But the journey of our lives through time, because of technology, we've been able to travel in ways that our great, great grandparents could never even imagine. And I wonder if we've taken the time, as we did with our opening prayer, to actually sit a minute and let those things we've seen, those foods we've tasted, the incense we've inhaled and smelled, if we've let it change us, if we've taken the time to see God at work in all those different places, all those different people, those different traditions and recipes and styles, to discuss with our own spiritual mentors, whoever they are, what it's like to have seen that through our lens. What has it been like to see those animals through the lens of a North American person, our Canadian? That whether we walk along Hadrian's Wall, if you're lucky enough, the Great Wall of China, down one of those Cotswolds Wall, the Santiago, I mean, there are some fabulous walks. Maybe it was the Galloping Goose or down along Dallas Road. Whatever the walk is, we're invited to see, really see what God is doing in the diversity around us. 
And it's so easy to get home and not take a moment to think, you know what I saw? I saw something new today for the first time. So right here at home, right here in whatever you call your daily home life, your routine, there is so much more diversity than at first we know. You know how it is if you stop and look at a garden, you suddenly see a little pansy growing at the corner of something. You wonder, oh, I guess that's a volunteer. If you look at a crowd, you'll see all sorts of interesting things when you take the time. And that requires that we ask ourselves, what are you seeing? Asking our lens, what did you expect to see that isn't here? What is here that you weren't expecting? Because it's really, really hard to see something that you weren't expecting. They say that the vast majority, over 96% of the world, sees the word stop when they come up to a red sign that says spot. Because they just tidy it up for us, don't they? They just make, well, you were expecting stop, so here it is. So my prayer today is that Pope Francis is able to do the unexpected and that those who have been so abused for generations are able to feel something deep within them and that we can be supportive of that. It could be, we know, transformational. We know as well it could be very painful. And there's not a single person in Canada who isn't aware of, I believe, of both those possibilities. And so we talk about eating together. Remember Micah's invitation to us was to do justice. How do we do that when we've come back home with something different? So I think it's that same thing just one more time. What did we witness that excluded somebody? What did we witness that charmed us because it included everybody, like that feast of 7,000? This series with Rick Steves has offered us opportunities to think about both of those things. I'm very grateful for it because the fun of travel often leads to shock. You know, you go, wow, I didn't expect to see that. You don't have to be in Vegas to see things that shock you. But when we have tasted the food, as it were, in an analogy, as we've savored the flavors, as we've inquired about the cooking methods, we've allowed ourselves to see the world through different lenses. And this is a tremendous gift as we recognize the beautiful diversity and play of God. So much so. Meals can be miracles, as we read today. It could be a miracle because you didn't think you had enough food, or it could be a miracle because in that time together with somebody else or by yourself, something opened within you. Something opened within your spirit, and you felt, I have been changed. I have to confess that when I was in the Holy Land and they had all that incense, I fainted. I saw what I heard him say about leave your Protestant self at the door. I thought, okay, I didn't pass that one very well. But it was wonderful. The next time I, I opened my suitcase, my jacket had that fragrance on it of the incense, and I loved it at a safe distance. So we're invited over and over again by life to open our eyes and open our hearts to what's going on around us. Rick Steves, some of you have been lucky enough to read his stuff, watch his, tra his travel logs, or even travel with him. But one of the things he wrote in one of his books, he said, some of our most prized souvenirs that we often bring home from being away, far away, the travels are strands of different cultures which we decide to knit into our own character. Strands, colors, into our fabric, the threads of other experiences, the taste of other recipes, the aroma of other fragrances. I wonder what we will knit together from our time together this summer. What threads will you include in the fabric that you will have at the end of August? When we love, 
and we seek to love that vision of Micah, of all of the world loving justice and doing it with humility. I believe then the blanket of inclusion is the blanket we are knitting, a blanket that we have been challenged to try to find out the stitches for each day of the summer season. And as we close, we just think of our siblings across Canada who are watching Alberta and praying, praying to hear a special word. I don't know what that word would be, but I pray that all goes well for them. Amen. Mm -hmm.